What's up, Mighty Networks community? Welcome to our second episode of Ask MAT Anything. Today, we have Aaron Locken in here with us, who is going to answer some of your questions. We have some big questions here today, so you may hear a few questions. But I think these are some of the most important questions that will be asked. And I look forward to having Aaron answer these questions. And I look forward to doing more of these episodes with more of your questions. So please keep sending those questions in. And we'll be looking forward to answering them. So without further ado, here's Aaron. All right, guys. So here's Aaron. Uh, Aaron, introduce yourself a little bit to the community who hasn't met you yet, although I'm sure many of them have. Well, at this stage of the game, that's kind of fun. Um, my name is Aaron Locken, and I've been doing MAT since 2005. Uh, I started assisting as an instructor in 2010, uh, about four years after I was certified. I've hosted courses all over the country. I've taught courses all over the country. I've been into Mexico to do work for Greg with uh, testing out practitioners and instructors. Um, I run energy fitness and performance in Cincinnati, Ohio, where we base our whole practice off the tenets of MAT. Um, outside of that, I don't really know what more to tell you other than I've been doing this a long time and I screwed up a lot and I've been around long enough to know that uh, Greg has told me I've screwed up a lot and I've come enough along the way that he trusts me to answer questions for him with a mindset of him so and plus this is a this is an ama with two fine looking men with bald heads and beards so there we go what could go wrong welcome to wednesday Not nothing uh all right so let's do this so we got christopher pierce who asked the question are there body parts that would take higher priority than others example a uh, client has shoulder pain cam exam shows equal limitation on equal limitations on right shoulder protraction left side left trunk side bend and right cervical extension now equal show cam shows equal limitations on three different things so we have a shoulder limitation we have a trunk yeah. limitation and we have a cervical limitation do you think that there's one that takes priority over the other or what's your thought process on that yeah, that's a really good question i think the first thing that we would probably go back to is you're not talking about what is the tor. Well, he did say what the torso limitation was, a side bend limitation. Um, most practitioners that are being instructed, I think we always set up this hierarchy of needs based off of is the torso stable first? And if you're talking about a, a building, and if you look at the vertebral column of five floors of a lumbar, 12 of a thoracic, and then how do I have my seven cervical on top of it? And then my head sitting on top of that. You got to have a foundation first, right? And we've talked with everybody about what is the best part for a foundation? And it's the base floor. And I don't know, you said his name is Christopher, right? So let's say, Christopher, you were going through and setting up a process of how do I create that stability inside of his lumbar spine? If you still had a limitation with lateral flexion, that would be my priority at this point. If you still think there's a trunk limitation, I'm not just going to bounce up to a cervical spine uh, at that point if, because there's, he said it was shoulder pain or cervical pain and or both. Um, he said client has shoulder pain. Shoulder pain. Yeah, I'm still at the point where uh, I'm going to go to the lumbar spine, thoracic spine, make sure there's stability about all three axes of motion, flexion, extensions, rotations, and side bends. But that also necessitates that if that's a new client, so this is the situational component that exists. Uh, if it's a new client, you're probably going to have to go after some torso things right away before you start trying to convince them. Uh, did I say shoulder stuff? You have to go after shoulder stuff or did I say torso? I think you started with torso. I think you said the foundational aspects of torso. Yeah. We talk about shoulder. I, I, yeah, if they're a new client, I still think you have to go after shoulder stuff right away. Develop that confidence in the fact that range of motion is going to tell you that you have, it, it, if there's a limitation, then you're going to have to do something about that limitation. You got to build confidence in the fact that you can do something to improve the stability, which will improve the dysfunction, right? 
And we know if there's dysfunction, there's probably poor kinematics, which means there's probably pain associated. So new client situation opposed to somebody that's coming in with you all the time, I'm going to be erring on the side of going to a shoulder. If it's somebody that's well-established and they walk in the door and they see you once a week, twice a week, once, twice a month, whatever it may be, then you have carte blanche, I think, at that point to go back and start looking at what's going to be taking place with your range of motions. And then I would err on the side of if you have a trunk limitation, you're going to look at the trunk limitation first. Then you're going to look at the sh uh, shoulder starting proximal and moving distal. So SC joint motion, um, clear all of the ranges, upward, downward, protraction, retraction. Then you can bounce into your cervical stuff after that. I don't think the cervical is going to be the thing that I would jump at first. And most of the time, the cervical is going to be clearing up uh, or being cleared up by a lot of what's taking place with the lumbar, thoracic, and the SC joint motion. That makes sense. And I, and, I, and I do think this is a question that comes up for practitioners at all levels. And I think this sort of sets on this foundational aspect of a lot of people who go through the full body process that go, where do I start? You know, and I got the, this. Yeah. And I think that's the hard part for everybody in terms of this, but you can't go anywhere unless you have a, a foundation, right? I mean, Greg's been talking about foundation, foundation, your torso is your foundation outside of that. If you're standing you need to be good at foot stuff, right? Your foot is what sets the stage for everything above it in terms of its control. So we don't want to just get so honed in on one thing, but the idea of, you know, if you're a practitioner that only has the ability to look at certain spots because you have not been through other areas, you're going to be limited in what you have the capability of executing. But if you're a full body practitioner already, depending if it's specialist mastery or rx level if you're an rx level person and you're still having neck limitations you're missing a foundation earlier on in a process if you're a mastery and specialist level person and you're having cervical limitations and you've gone through for the most part torso and shoulder stuff you're probably still missing something so it behooves us to all dial in on that process and make sure that we can look at the whole but foundationally with the torso to a shoulder in this situation now the other thing no. too that we don't ever get to talk about there's not people asking this question so we don't know the context about the person how long you've been treating them you know what other issues do they have what type of stress level does this person have so we're just looking at this based off of some typewritten things and we don't really know the whole story so if we're giving you information that you don't like as a whole I you know that's a reach out to one of us as an instructor and see if we can further enhance your perspective on the client yeah and I think a lot of times with MAT it becomes a choose your own adventure sort of a situation and each client has their own experience and in, in how that gets treated and so we ourselves are going to have certain ideas about the treatment process whereas the person treating them is going to have their own ideas about the treatment process it's like you know, we always teach this in, in MAT, which is follow the process, but you you could try some stuff. Like, don't, don't go outside the guidelines of MAT. But yeah, that's very interesting because the, I think Greg, you'll hear often say, start with plan A. And if plan A doesn't work and you know you executed plan A well, then what is your next plan? Well, if it's B, then C and keep going on down the line. So you can come up with a solution and take notes, right? I know a lot of practitioners that don't take notes on sessions. And I'm like, how do you know what you're doing from week to week or session to session if you've not taken a note? I mean, especially if you're seeing 15, 20, 25 hours a week of clients and you can't remember all that. You got to go write that and build a thought process. And I think we're, we're going to dive down this rabbit hole, I guess, a little bit more. But like, I think the other thing we probably see a lot more of is that people that treat the same thing over and over again, yeah. um, that the kind of fall into this trap of, I, I don't want to say like habitual practice, but like something that they're like, I just get, I, if I treat this, this person feels better. And so let's keep treating that until it doesn't, it stops feeling better. Yeah, it's interesting because I think we have to also look at the fact that MAT is designed to assess 
the neurological component of a process where we get physiological adaptations from it, but there's still, so if we're increasing the set point neurologically, we also have a physiological set point that needs to be bumped. So whether it's endurance strength or power, which is being looked at from a tolerance standpoint, we need to encourage that individual to be looking for healthy options as far as exercise goes, that's going to allow them to continue to boost the neurological as we are improving the physiological. Yeah, and we'll, we'll, we'll delve more into conversations about exercise down the line inside the Mind Networks program. So we'll, we'll definitely yeah. touch more on that base. So let's jump to something else related to sort of the foundations of the MAT process. So Brandon Kalisha, Brandon Kaleha Shaw, I was yeah. name of, uh, asked the question, can you talk a little bit about what constitute a failed test? I know we're looking for a contraction on demand that can meet our force for two seconds, but what does not meeting that force look like and feel like? For example, sometimes I feel a bit pushed around in a test if a client is compensating. Then after a defa mat, they'll come back cleaner with a counter force. Okay. So without us watching somebody do a test, right? Which is kind of the caveat to this question. We don't know what you're doing, Brandon. Um, we've watched you test, otherwise we wouldn't have passed you through these things in the first place. So we know that you're at least competent in the area of saying, I can set this up, I can perform the forces, but now you're starting to get to the point where you've been doing this a while and you're trying to figure out, well, how do I improve upon a process to ensure that I'm getting better results? And a failed test, I think I always go back to the point when I'm looking at uh, teaching a test in the first place, if it says 30 degrees of hip flexion, fully externally rotated with a sagittal plane force into extension. So we're doing an iliacus type test. If that individual is set up in those positions, the only spot we should see them move based off of what the setup states is hip extension. Now we know it's not the case because people are going to come in, they're going to try to compensate, they're going to try to win. Um, there's a few different directions that you can take this as a practitioner. One, if you've gone through and re-explained, match my pressure in this test, don't try to overpower me, right? So the whole point is, can you sustain a test against an applied force? And that applied force should be a light pressure. It's not a you trying to rip their leg off and they can't maintain that position without compensating, then you know that we have an issue. So I think it goes back to that pillar of, if you are asking something to hold a position and maintain a position, but they can't do it without what is perceived as compensatory motion, then it's a weak test. Also try to refine what that client is doing as part of the dance, right? It takes two people to tango, right? That crazy verbiage of if this person is on the table and they're part of this equation and you're trying to navigate a process by which you apply a force, if they don't understand what it should feel like, then they're going to just entertain themselves and it's going to be a disco fest and it's not going to look like it's even the same type of dance that you are doing. So... I have clients and ironically, it's these hyper type A personality people that they're trying to win no matter what. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. So quite often around the table, I'm extremely subdued. So I have to change my attitude and my perspective and quiet my uh, energy level and walk that person back through, hey, listen, we got you set up in this position. The first thing we need to do once we get you to that position is you need to be completely relaxed, okay? And then I'm going to apply a minimal force to see if you can actually match my force. So if we re-cue the process and we put ourselves in a situation where we're removing the client's bias and we try to bring them back around to be re-educated, it may be a helpful starting point. 
Yeah, I want to touch a little bit about what you just said, which is, I think you said requeuing the process and what you said, because I was kind of, as you were talking, I was a little bit, not nitpicking the question, but I was rereading the question. And one of the things that came back to me was, after the defamat, they'll come back with a cleaner counterforce. And that word counterforce kind of stuck in my head for a second, because if you want to talk about this for a minute, and that you kind of did, the difference between what we are asking them to do, which is match our force and produce a counterforce, feel like two different things. Yeah, the idea of match the pressure which I give you, I, I talk with clients about this when we're trying to educate the perspective. And the first perspective is if I were pushing into the wall, the wall pushes back against me as hard as I push against it. Same with the ground, right? Now, if I have you lying on your back and your leg is in the air, the first thing that I struggle with with most people is they don't even get to the point where they're relaxed. So then we're not even doing an NPR test, like a response test, that active muscle contract and sustain test is predicated off of the fact that we have to have relaxation to a response, okay? If that person's not relaxed right away and then you start your test as a practitioner, a lot of times it seems like they're trying to change the position. So at that point, I typically will tell them, I have you at end range of where you can go already. You can't go any further. So if you're going to try to push harder into a position where you can't go any further, you're potentially doing your own damage to your own joint. You're creating your own inflammatory response. So let's back off, dial off, and this whole match the pressure versus a counterforce. I think about it, that counterforce, I could see where somebody says a counterforce is the same thing as a match my pressure, only if the intention of the client is the same. But if their intention is to move you further rather than maybe the cueing of that verbiage of stay in this place. I mean, you ever use that where you're thinking about stay here, don't go anywhere else. Yeah, and I like to use, you know, things that I use are like, don't let me move you. So it forces them to stay in the same position. But it's some version of that because I have to meet whatever the client understands best to that particular thing I want them to do. Yeah, there's typically repeat offenders, right? Where yeah. you're, you, you every now and then will have to go back to the same person and go, hey, just remember, this is a match my pressure. Don't go any further. Stay where you are. Um, you're at the end already. You can't go any further, right? Um, and it's not that these clients are dumb. It's probably because they're smart people, but it's they're hyper-focused on other places. And obviously, if they're weak inside of a situation as well, if they're weak already, they're, they're going to be compensating. And that's the part of the equation that we've not talked about. If they're weak and you're applying a good force, so there's that caveat of, is your force as a practitioner correct? If your force as a practitioner isn't correct, now we have a completely different scenario by which we're not giving the proper input to get the proper output from them. So dial back on yourself, look at where your axis of motion is, look at where your application of force is, and know do I have that in the right position or is the client compensating because I'm giving them poor input? Yeah, no, I think that's very well put. I want to ask the other thing you mentioned here, and this was not part of the question, so we'll say, you know, Ilya Fishman asks, but talk a little bit about relaxation, because you mentioned that relax, and I feel like in my teaching, when I've watched people a lot, I feel like that's a thing they forget sometimes saying. I know we hammer into people's heads like, yeah, yeah ready, you know, you know, uh, set the position, go here, go here, relax, ready, hold, relax, ready, resist, whatever the word is. But oftentimes I still see people go, okay, come here, here, okay, go. And you're like, well, wait a minute, where's the relax word? Yeah, I, I really like that follow-up to the question because I remember teaching in DC one time and there was a student coming back for CEUs and he had never heard the cue relax first and then hold after that. And he couldn't come up with the concept of how are they going to relax, then hold. And I said, this is really simple. It's a game of Simon Says. Simon Says, lie on the table. Simon Says, turn your leg out to the side. 
Simon says, lift your leg up to the sky. Simon says, let your, relay, your leg relax down into my hand. That's sometimes how I have to re-cue to those people that are that high, strung, let's go, let's go. I'm like, no, 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 no. First of all, relax your mind. Listen to the words that I'm saying. Follow the process. So, if, and, and, and I'm not trying to be demeaning to these people, but if we don't teach them what we expect out of the process so we can execute it accordingly, then we don't win. So those folks that come back down to, well, how do I relax? Then how do I hold something? I'm like, dude, it's a game. Simon says, raise your right arm. Simon says, let your right arm drop down. Well, if they're stuck in this other spot, they can't go to another cue from that position yet until they go back to where we actually need them. Okay. So the idea of this process of relax, the whole point of an active muscle contract and sustain test, we describe it as contraction, a reflexive contraction from a relaxed state. So if we're looking at a reflexive contraction from a relaxed state, that person can't have conscious motor control involvement about that test or the muscles being tested already. We have to get them to the point where the tissues which we are going to test are relaxed so we can apply a force and we can test the unconscious component of those tissues. No, I, I, and I think that makes total sense. And so let, let's touch on this last question. So this is going to be more of like a hierarchical MAT follow-up. And yeah. we had somebody from our own staff kind of ask this question because I thought it was a really good question to ask, right? So let's discuss when do you use each particular MAT-based product? Specifically, let's kind of go to RX and say, what is the best time to use RX with someone versus what is a good time to use specialist or mastery level skill with someone? And, you know, it, I was thinking about this as you were setting the question up, because guys that you, you that are listening to this, we talked about the questions beforehand a little bit, and I wrote it down and I asked this question of myself going, well, when do you do these things? For those of you that don't know what RX is, it's Greg's highest level of programming where he teaches a very specific hierarchical process of an order in which muscles must be treated to raise their set point and their tolerance. Okay. Furthermore, it's, there's more steps involved with it just than treating them in a particular order. It's much more in depth than that. Um, so if somebody has been through all of those levels, the person that was asking this question has, they're an RX specialist. I think they've been through the STEM process too, if I recall. I mean, I remember her being there with me, so it was a long time ago, so I just kind of forget, but yeah, she was. Um, when we were learning RX for the first time in 2012, somebody else brought up this question to Greg and Greg said, if I can lock that person into the RX process, meaning their body is responsive to a bilateral process and you can lock the tissues into the central nervous system saying left side and right side both said we can party. We can do this. He's going to do it. If he can do it because the central nervous system will allow when he asks the appropriate questions, then he's going to be doing RX. Now, the things that I sit back and I look at with clients, because uh, I have a, a, a pretty set client base. I've been doing MAT, like I said, this is coming on 18 years right now. And some of my clients have been with me since before I was doing MAT. Yeah, so that we're talking about 20 years of time with some of the same people. Um, they evolved with me through every iteration, good or bad, of me as a practitioner, whether it was specialist, jumpstart, master specialist, RX foot hand, RX total body, RX stim total body. So they've been through the gamut, but I was hopefully building their tolerance level the entire time. Now, this comes also back to a situation question. If you have somebody that's brand new that comes to you and you're not comfortable with your skills as a practitioner, taking that individual into 
vulnerable end range positions, or look at the other parts of that equation. What if it's somebody that has an autoimmune disease and you're not comfortable because you don't believe they have the tolerance to handle some of the positions that you would place them in passively, whether it's whether you're doing RX or mastery level pieces, you have to dial back and look at that situation and build some tolerance with some MAT. I had a gal come in recently who has all kinds of stuff going on. I mean, it's a hot mess of hodgepodge of I'm on this medicine, I do this, I have this other medicine that I take and the litany of things that she was doing to deal with pain because of multiple spinal stenoses, knee problems, hip problems, cervical problems, shoulder problems. I mean, there wasn't an area of her body that wasn't affected. And it was a woman who is not but in her mid to late forties. And I thought for a second, man, where am I supposed to go with this? Well, she's not athletic. She's in pain walking in the door, right? Do I just need to build some general tolerance for this person so they can feel good enough before I go stress them at end range of joint positions? Now flip that on the other hand, you take one of my Bengals guys who came to me the first time and I'm like, this kid's thrashing himself all the time. He's strong as all get out. I'm just going to talk to him about the process and let him understand what was going on. He said, do what you need to do. I'm going to be back every week. I've been referred to you. I, I, I'm in this. I'm like, okay, great. Then I can have a completely different perspective. And I have a young, healthy individual with a higher set point. I can go to those end range positions a lot easier. Now reverse that. What happens when he comes in and he has an elbow problem and the elbow process is so much further down the line and it's elbow wrist hand stuff because somebody landed on it. I might need to just jump out of an order which might be there and I might need to go put out some fires for this person right away and then go back into the process and build the tolerance and we will get to it when we get to it in the hierarchy. So you have to ask that question situationally what are you good at? What are your skills? What is the tolerance of the individual? How far down the line is what they're having a problem with that day when they walk in? And from that, where do we put that individual along the process uh, and come up with a solution for them that day, right? It's, it's not as just cut and dry as how do, let's get there and do it. But if you've had that person with you for a lot longer, I think it becomes a lot easier for you to jump into RX and stay there and put out fires when you need to accordingly. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I think that's probably the best way to answer that because people do get confused a lot of times about when is each process the most appropriate for a person. And it is individualized and it is very yeah. specific. So we, we have to do that. All right. Last question, quick hitter. I'm going to ask you this is again, Ilya Fishman asks my question. Okay. New person entering the MAT process, new person entering MA, the, the Mighty Networks, new person signing up for a class. What is one piece of advice you can give to a new person starting a class? So they've never taken MAT class before? Never taken. Brand new, right? They're, they're, they're certified. They're an expert. They're professional in the industry. They're just starting MAT. What, 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 what is one piece of advice you can give them? That I came from the era where this didn't exist because being one of the first classes to come through, you know, you, you first, you know, Greg's six, seven internships, whatever, along the way, we didn't have mentors. We didn't have people that had failed at this point. Goodness gracious. You know, I, I was thinking about this the other day, if I've been treating X monitor of years and I've done 3 million muscle tests, I've, I've figured out how they don't work and I figured out how they do work. And Greg talks about that all the time as experience. Well, how do you know if you're doing something correctly? Kind of like Brandon's question was earlier. You got to find a mentor. You got to find groups of people around you that have gone through and messed up and they know how to help build a process for you. And I think part of what you guys are creating with this is opportunities for people to show up in Colorado and have somebody have their hands on you so you can feel something but the idea of mentorship to me is key because without somebody that's gone ahead had the successes had the failures delved further into the questions you're not going to be as successful as you should so inundate yourself in the community 
the best you possibly can. Find people around you locally that are, let's qualify this, certified in good standing and have been constantly refining what they do, opposed to, oh man, I get treated by somebody that, you know, they went through the internship in 2005, but they haven't been back. They've not listened to what Greg has changed over the last 15, 18, 20 years. You know, that person may not be the best person to try to glean wisdom from because things have changed and adapted so much. So I would tell you to find mentors and be inundated into the community. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. I think the most success that we have, and we have data to prove this, but people who have mentors seem to just perform a little bit better because they have that support system around them. And it's not to say that somebody can't be successful without a support system. We have yeah. people, we have a person in Costa Rica who's all by himself, who is successful. You know, so we do have that situation. I believe actually Brandon, uh, who was asked a question earlier, I believe he started out in a different country when he first started this process. Yeah. So we, we do have that success, but having that mentor is very important. And you yourself have mentored many students, including your own employees through this process. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's funny. Uh, I had a client asking me the other day, like, well, how many students have you been around? I'm like, uh, thousands at this point. I mean, if you talk about 13 years of being involved as uh, an instructor, that's a lot of people that have come through the program at this point. And, you know, when you talk about Greg and Megan, me, I mean, you're talking about several thousand students that we've had around us. And the successful ones are those that buy into the fact that there's always something that you can do to refine. And, uh, you know, to be humble enough to have Greg look at you and go, you're still not there yet. You're missing pieces because he's always figuring out further pieces. Um, you you got to find those people around you that are willing to help you, but then also you have to be willing to be helped and molded. I'm going to do a little uh, shout out to somebody the other day. So we had a student just finished up, finish um, trunk and spine the other day. And um, he messaged me because I was not there on Sunday, unfortunately, because I was, I tested positive mm. for COVID. Um, but he messaged me about the test. And I said, I heard you did really, really well. And his response to me was, I think I did okay. You know, I wasn't as practiced as I thought I'd be. And yeah. as we discussed, it was, well, you're going to get better, right? And so one of the things that was brought up is, um, he's like, I'm 1% better today, but there's 365 days in a year. So I'm going to be 365% better by the end of this year. Yeah, love it. All right, on that note, guys, my name is Ilya. This is Aaron. Aaron is out of Cincinnati, Ohio. He, uh, If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to him inside of Mighty Networks or ask him for the best bike or food spots inside the city of Cincinnati. There you go. Um, otherwise, you guys, we'll be back to you hopefully soon with another episode with another expert in the MAT practice and hope to see everybody on Mighty Networks. Take care. Cheers.